Well, a very warm welcome to you all to the service this morning. And also, if you're joining us online, we're pleased to have your company that way with us as well. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things from the intimations. They're all on the bu bulletin sheet as usual. Uh, if you can just read through them yourselves, please. Uh, just a reminder that there is a, a, a Kirk session. That's tomorrow evening in the upper hall. And that's at 7 p.m. And you can see an advance notice there as well of, for Tuesday 23rd of uh, WFM meeting. You can read the details through there for yourselves. Uh, as you can see from uh, the bulletin here, we've had to cancel uh, the uh, Sunday school and creche and tweenies, regretfully, and also the toddler group on Monday uh, until after the midterm break, at least the uh, break next week. Um, we'll see what, what it's like after that. But we thought uh, the best thing in the circumstances with an increase in the number of COVID cases in the, in the area, especially amongst the young folk, uh, that it would be better just to, to be safe to cancel uh, these meetings for the moment. Uh, you can read through the rest of the intimations for yourselves. Uh, it's just about on the hour, and uh, we are going to observe a minute's silence, but this being Remembrance Sunday. Uh, so if we can observe a minute's silence uh, from about now. Let's just stay silent for a minute. Thank you. We will begin our worship now and we're singing first of all today from Psalm 116. Psalm 116, this is in the Scottish Psalter version on page uh, 395. We're singing verses 1 to 8. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I while I live will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Of death the cords and sorrows did about me compass round. The pains of hell took hold on me. I grief and trouble found. Upon the name of God, the Lord, then did I call and say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. God merciful and righteous is, yea, gracious is our Lord. God saves the meek, I was brought low, he did me help afford. And we'll sing to the end of verse 8 in Psalm 116, I love the Lord. We stand again to sing.
Let's call upon the Lord together now in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you again that we can gather here today in this place of worship associated with your great name. We thank you for the privilege you give us every time we come together, that we are privileged to call upon the name of the Lord, to seek the Lord's blessing, to seek his favor and his face. And we ask, Lord, that your face will shine upon us today, that we will know in your hearts that you are remembering us as we seek to draw near to you here in worship. We thank you, O Lord, for all the privileges we do have. We acknowledge that they have come our way not by our own earning or our own merit, where we are not deserving of the least of your mercies. And yet, O Lord, you fill our lives abundantly from day to day with so many good things. You remember us in so many ways that are far beyond our own uh, ability to number or even think reasons why. We thank you, Lord, for all that makes you glorious today. And we come before you as sinners seeking your forgiveness, your cleansing, seeking that you would establish us in the ways of holiness, seeking that you would forgive, O Lord, our sin. For we have sinned against you many times, even since we last met together here. We acknowledge, Lord, that our sin is with us every day, and that even though you in, your experience, in the experience of your people, you have uh, dealt with the root of sin in their hearts. Nevertheless, O oh Lord, we know that we actively uh, sin against you each day, that we do so in our thoughts and in our speech, in our motives, in our actions. Lord, our God, we pray today that your forgiveness will be experienced by us as something that is very rich and lasting. And help us, Lord, we pray as we come near to you, to realize our, our need of your guidance, and of the way in which your Spirit directs your people. And we thank you today for that great promise that you will conduct and guide your people with your counsel. This was so precious to the psalmist so long ago, and we sing these words, O oh Lord, so often, uh, you with your counsel will lead me and conduct me and bring me at last into your glory. And Lord, we give thanks for that hope that your people are able to express. I hope that you have created through the gospel and especially through your spirit working in their hearts. And we give thanks, Lord, that that hope will not be put to shame. There are many things in this life that we hope for in an ordinary sense that may never come to pass. We have, O oh Lord, experience of hoping for things which we know are beyond our reach and will never be ours. And yet we give thanks that the eternal life that you have given to your people and that they have a hope in their heart towards will never disappoint them, that that hope will always uh, be something which throughout eternity they will dwell upon and realize in its fruition the wonder of it. We thank you today for all that gives us that hope, that we have a hope especially through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this first day of the week and each week that passes is a reminder to us, O oh Lord, that you have conquered death, that you are set above death permanently forevermore, that you are at the right hand of the glory on high, that you direct all things by your wise counsel, that you are made king and head of your church over all things for your church's benefit. Lord, we thank you that our hope is today anchored firmly in such solid facts. And we pray that you would constantly remind us when we come to doubt and when we come to times when we may be perplexed and wonder if the Lord has indeed forgotten us. O oh Lord God, we pray that that hope in our hearts will be revived and quickened and that we will focus each time upon all that you have done and all that you are in your own person. So remember us, we pray today as a congregation. Grant us your blessing, Lord, as we seek to serve you in the various ways in which we seek to do that from week to week. Uh, we pray for our young people. We pray for them at this time, especially when there has been a, a, an additional outbreak of the COVID virus amongst uh, the children, amongst our schools. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them and keep them. Uh, we pray for their safety. We pray especially for your guidance of them, for your instruction of them. Uh, give them in their young hearts, Lord, to yearn for you and to know uh, that you are their God and their Lord. We pray that you'd bless them 
in their family circles, bless their, their parents, bless the teachers in our schools, and bless them at this time, O oh Lord, as they face additional uh, responsibilities and difficulties uh, as this COVID virus uh, keeps uh, on in our community. Uh, we pray that you bless all others, Lord, who are directly involved in dealing with uh, this COVID virus and with the provisions that need to be made locally and nationally against it. We give thanks, Lord, for the progress that has been made. And we pray that you would continue, Lord, to remember us as a people, uh, despite the fact that we are undeserving of such. Yet, Lord, we look to you as one who is gracious and kind as we have been singing in your praise. And we ask that in our hearts today, we may know something anew of the joy of the Lord, and the joy of your salvation, the celebration of all that you have done and all that you promise yet to do for your people. And so we pray that you bless us as a nation, bless us, Lord, in these times when so much has taken place in the past weeks with regard to a conference and uh, talk about uh, the climate uh, the climate and the state of the world. Lord, again, we pray that you would remember us as a people uh, when we know that uh, so largely we have turned away from you. We have turned our back to you and gone after other gods, gods of our own fashioning, idols that we have made with our own hands. And we bow down before them and we serve them and we despise your ways we turn away from your truth. Lord, our God, have mercy upon us, we pray. Turn us back to yourself. Turn us with a spirit of repentance to your truth. And give us once again, Lord, as a people, to know the reviving, quickening work of your spirit amongst us. Lord, direct us, we pray, away from all that is foolish and merely human. And turn us, we pray, into the ways of the Lord. And graciously hear all those who pray today for this. And graciously, Lord, answer us, we pray, and come in your own righteousness and in your power. Establish righteousness amongst us, for it is that alone which exalts a nation, and sin is a reproach to any people. And so we pray that you'd bless us now, and continue, Lord, to watch over us as this week unfolds. We pray for all who are ill at this time. We ask that you'd be near to them, especially those who have serious illness, either in hospital or at home, we ask that you would graciously be with them. Bless those who care for them. Bless the nursing staff and doctors and those in the hospice and in the care homes and those who do care in our community. And we thank you for all of them. We thank you that they are so dedicated to their work. And we pray that you'd be pleased, Lord, to bless and protect them as they go about their work from day to day. Hear us, Lord, we pray now. Continue with us and bless us freely and forgive us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, there may be some children online, I'm sure, today, so I'm going to just say a few words uh, at this point. Uh, today is Remembrance Sunday, as we've mentioned, uh, and as we observed, a minute's silence. Well, what is it that we remember on Remembrance Sunday? It's not just on Remembrance Sunday, uh, not even uh, at Remembrance time this time of year. But we do remember uh, those who gave their lives especially in the two great world wars, but also not forgetting those who've given their lives in conflicts at other times as well, since then especially. And we remember them, and it's right for us to remember this, because they died seeking to secure our freedoms. Uh, today, if you would go to a place like North Korea, you would then realize more so if you had to visit there, you would realize more why freedom is important. And we remember those who died for our freedom because the freedom we enjoy is a freedom, a freedom of speech, freedom to have our opinion heard. That includes the gospel as well. And we're thankful for the fact that we're still able to do that, even though that too is under threat in some cases. We have a freedom of religion. We have a freedom where we and uh, no, don't necessarily at all agree with every other religion, but we don't persecute people because they believe differently to ourselves. Uh, they have the freedom of conscience to believe what they believe and for us to believe what we believe and to worship as we do worship. And all of these freedoms were very much under threat, uh, especially during the two world wars, uh, because the oppressing enemy uh, were seeking to 
do away with such freedoms. And if we hadn't had these freedoms secured, if we didn't have uh, those who had gone to war to fight for the nation and for the nations of the world that wanted to secure freedom, we too today very likely would be like North Korea, places where the gospel is not allowed, where freedom is not uh, allowed uh, of the, of, in these things that I've mentioned. So today, children, as you remember these things, remember that freedom is very precious to us. And the Bible speaks about freedom, freedom in a spiritual sense especially, freedom from sin, freedom from the guilt of sin, being set free from all that sin is and has done to us. And that, of course, is important in the way that the Bible calls upon us to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We do that, although we haven't done it for some time, because of the COVID virus, we do it in the Lord's Supper when we take communion, because that's what the Lord said, this do in remembrance of me. And that, of course, is the most important death that ever took place, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did that to secure the freedom for his people, a freedom from sin, freedom into eternal life. So today we give thanks to God for our freedom and we give thanks that we remember those who gave their lives and we do so thankfully to the Lord. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's read from God's Word. We're reading today from the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 11. And we can read through the whole chapter. Matthew 11 at the beginning. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ... He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, <clears throat> yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done and you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I would like us to think for a little time today of these words uh, from verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. I heard the voice of Jesus, of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, O weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad, and found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. These words of that hymn by Horatius Boner are obviously based on this passage of Scripture where we find Jesus inviting his hearers at that time and inviting us today through the gospel to come and find our rest in him. And so we're taking the passage as another of our studies as we go on looking at what it is to follow Jesus, uh, because the passage contains details that are relevant to following Jesus. And as you see, the main emphasis in the passage is that Jesus will give rest to those who come to him. I will give you rest, he says, and you will find rest. He repeats this twice, uh, the, the, the rest that he promises to, the, to those who will come to himself. But you'll notice the rest is actually something that's done by coming to him, but also taking his yoke upon us, which we'll see in a minute uh, refers to uh, our coming under his leadership, but especially under his teaching. And you need to take both of these together. It's not just that we receive rest by coming to Jesus without taking account of taking his yoke, putting on his yoke, coming under his teaching, being directed in our life by him. Nor is it just a matter of taking his yoke upon us and coming to be taught, for example, through reading the Bible, uh, through coming to church like we're doing today, but without coming to himself. You have to take both parts of uh, the passage here together. Come to me, take my yoke upon you. These are the two imperatives, and they belong together, and we must never separate them because it's important that we see the whole thing as the means by which we come to experience the rest that Jesus promised. So we look at those two, come to me and take my yoke upon you as the two main headings for today. Come to me. Who is it who are invited? Who are invited to come to Jesus? Well, he explains it himself. He mentions, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. He specifies, these are the ones especially that he's addressing as he addresses the crowd. Come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, who have burdens, come to me and find rest in me. Now, his initial audience, of course, um, would have been very used to and oppressed by the weights that their religion had placed upon them. Not so much their religion itself, but the Pharisees' version of it, and how these religious leaders had imposed so many, many regulations and laws and procedures that were not at all required by Scripture, by the Old Testament as they had it then. These were regulations, uh, these were laws that they had imposed themselves. And Jesus, frequently in the Gospels, you find him accusing the Pharisees of uh, 
uh, requiring so much of the people. Now, people under that sort of regime, under that, uh, under, under all of those minute laws that they were required or had to keep or were supposed to keep, anybody, any people, any person would become very easily wearied, exasperated, discouraged under that sort of system. And as he's addressing the crowd, that's especially what Jesus has in mind. He knows what they're going through. He knows their burden. He knows they're discouraged. He knows they're exasperated by all of these rules and regulations that are man-made. And so he calls upon them to come to himself and to find relief from that burden, to come to find their rest in himself. And of course, that's always how it is with what you can call a do-it-yourself salvation. When you try and please God by your own efforts, which I'm sure most of us at one time tried to do, you come to realize very soon, or somewhere along the line, you come to realize that you just can't do that. And you keep breaking the things that you had placed before yourself as, as rules, or maybe even the commandments of God as you find them in the Bible, and you become exasperated, and you realize that this just isn't working. You become discouraged, and uh, as time goes on, you hopefully come to realize that that's not how we come to be saved at all, uh, that that's simply a legalistic self-righteousness that we're attempting, which is only going to burden us increasingly the more we try it. But of course, what Jesus says here applies to all of life's burdens. We mustn't uh, even taking account of the focus in the passage on the time of Jesus himself and who he was referring to especially, uh, we mustn't narrow it and, uh, down just to leave it at that as if that's the only application we have to the text, to this passage. He is today speaking to all of us. He's speaking to all those who hear the gospel and have specific burdens, whatever these burdens might be. And I'm sure every single one of us here today will confess that somewhere or other in our life there is a burden. There is something that is weighing us down, something that is making us anxious, something that we would love to be rid of, something we want relief from. Whatever it is today, your burden, whatever you're carrying, whatever burden you're conscious of, whether it's in your own life or on behalf of somebody else, every single one of us here today has a burden. And what Jesus is saying is, you come to me, bring yourself to me, bring yourself with your burdens. Maybe you're here today burdened over your sin, burdened over with a sense of guilt, burdened over the fact that you know you have not closed in with Jesus despite the many times you've heard the offer in the gospel of coming to himself. Maybe you're burdened today with the fact that this is the case, that you have not yet come to him in order to be saved, that you're still seeking to carry this yourself, that it's not going away and yet you haven't actually rolled it over onto Christ. Well, that's what he's saying to you today. Why go on wearying yourself if that's really the case, why go on carrying that burden when he is there to carry you and that burden and take it from you? Come to me, all you who are wearied and heavily burdened, whatever that burden is today, God, Christ will give you rest from it when you come to him. You come to him specifically to lay your burdens upon himself. And he then takes care and manages your life rather than yourself. But then you see, he is saying, come to me. Who is it who are invited? Those who are burdened and are heavy laden. And it's to himself. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. He's presenting himself there to the people as the one that will take the burdens off them. But who is this? Well, it's interesting and significant that the passage, uh, just the verses before that, uh, when Jesus is addressing the Father in heaven, he's giving thanks to the Father there in verse 25, but he goes on in verse 26 and 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. These are massive words. These, that's, this is a, a massive claim on the part of Jesus. Just imagine those people listening to him there and hearing him saying, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. 
He is referring to God, and he's saying, God has actually put in my possession all things that are necessary for the disposing of this world and all that will happen in this world and people's lives within this world. All of that has been handed over to me. I am the executor of the Father's will and of the Father's salvation, the Father's government. It's a staggering claim. And yet, that's the fact of the matter. And also, he goes on to say, that he is the only one, Jesus himself, who knows the Father. There are such depths, of course, to the being of God, to the will of God. Even the things that are revealed to us in the Bible, we can't get to the bottom or to the top of many of those great truths about God himself. And Jesus is saying, I know him. I know them all. No one knows the Father except the Son. And he goes on, no one knows the Son except the Father. There is such depth to Jesus himself, to the person of Jesus as God, to the union between God and human nature in Jesus, to comprise that one indivisible person of, of God and human, divine and human, in his own person. Who can possibly understand how that can be? How they exist together and coexist? Well, Jesus is saying, the Father knows that, and I know the Father. But he goes on also to say, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. See, because he's, what he's concerned for is that uh, people will come to himself as the way to the Father, as the way to God, as the way to experience who God is and what God does for his people. In other words, he's really saying to us today, come to me because I am the one who actually will bring you to know the Father. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to think that uh, when Jesus comes to change your life, uh, whether it's in a sudden way or in a gradual way, that's at his own disposal. Whatever he does to, to, to reveal himself to us or reveal God to us, that's really in his own hands. He is the only one who can bring us to know God. As he says in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so coming to Jesus is an indispensable uh, indispensable to, in order to know God. You imagine when Jesus comes into a person's life, it's as if he's, he's coming and saying, now I'm going to a very special palace with you. I'm going to God the Father. I'm going to introduce you to him. You'll know him as God, your Father. And I will say to him, here's another one, Father, that I have saved. Here's another one, that you become father to through me. Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden. Come to me, and I will give you rest. It's such a simple thing, isn't it? Such a clear thing that we come to Jesus himself, part of the, the following of Jesus begins by, we, by when we come to him. And when we come to him, that's the beginning of our spiritual journey that goes on then through life and into eternity. And that's why it's such an important thing today for me to ask myself and for you uh, to ask yourself as you listen to the voice of grace, the voice of God's grace through Jesus Christ saying, come to me. It's such an important thing to ask myself and to ask yourself, have you done this? Are you still standing at a distance from Jesus? Are you still standing in a way that's not quite yet taken him and come to him? Have you taken his word but not taken himself? Have you come to listen to the gospel today but not come to Jesus himself? Well, this was very often how Jesus spoke to those that he was, that he was uh, preaching to and those who listened to him. They were convinced that they had in the scriptures that they had the word of God. You are searching the Scriptures, he said to them, in John's Gospel, we had a record of that. Um, you, are, you are searching the Scriptures. This is something good that you're doing. 
for you think in them that you have eternal life. And of course, they were right up to an extent. The Jews believed that, that that's what God had given them, that he had deposited his word in their midst, that he had given this to them, and through it that they came to know eternal life. But he said, you will not come to me that you might have life. Most of us have more than one Bible in our homes, but do we have Jesus in our hearts? Have we come to himself? Have we given over our life to him as he's inviting us and indeed commanding us to do? For although these are invitations, come to me, take my yoke upon you, they are invitations that come to us with the force of an imperative. They're very genuine invitations, very open invitations, very sincere invitations. But you can see that they have the force of an imperative because it's God, it is the Son of God, it is the Lord who is speaking in these terms. And when he says, come, it's not just an invitation, it's a command, it's an imperative. It's something that addresses us with the force of his command, with his authority. And yet, it's all the same, a wonderful open invitation. Come to me, then he's saying. And the second thing is, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, not only does Jesus want to welcome sinners to himself, and that's very much the case with this open invitation, he's also concerned to train disciples, because that's what following him means. Uh, from the moment that you come to him, not only uh, do you follow him then, and not only does he then guide your life, but he trains you as a disciple. He trains us as his people, because that's exactly what a disciple is. It's somebody who has come under the trainership of Jesus, under the, tut under the tutorship of Jesus. He becomes their tutor. That's what a disciple is. That's why um, in these days, the, each, a rabbi used to have, uh, important rabbis certainly would have a group of followers taught by them, known as disciples. And in that sense, Jesus was no different. He had the group around him who were his disciples specifically, chosen by himself, the 12, and others that followed him and listened to him as well. But there's what a disciple is. And, and uh, that was a very common way of referring to uh, becoming a disciple. You took the yoke, a yoke being the, the piece of wood that was used generally to uh, bind a pair of oxen together um, when they went out to plow the fields or whatever. This uh, wood that was laid over their shoulders uh, meant that they could be kept tightly bound together but also controlled by the person who was guiding them and, and plowing behind them. So the yoke was placed onto the shoulders of the oxen, and they came under the guidance, the tutorship, if you like, of the, of the one who owned them and was plowing with them. And Jesus, is, uh, the, the, the term then, as Jesus uses it here, was used of becoming a disciple. When you became a disciple of a rabbi, you took that yoke upon you. And sometimes it was used even of the law of God. When you came to be taught the things of God, when you came to be taught the law of God, you were taking the yoke of the law and placing it upon yourself. And of course, remember, as we said at the beginning, that he's addressing those who labor and are heavy laden, because depending on the kind of yoke and depending on who has placed it on you and uh, how the, the control is, is going, uh, uh, how it's set about the control, it's either going to be very burdensome indeed and very tiring to, to, to actually bear it or else it's going to be the opposite. And what Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, if you join the disciples of Jesus, if you come to himself, when you come to himself, you become his disciple. And disciples learn together. That's what's leaving us here today, isn't it? We are here as disciples of the Lord. We are here under his yoke. We are here because we want to be taught by him, want to be further taught by him, to understand his will, to understand his word. And as you enroll in that school of discipleship, as you become a follower of Jesus, you're doing that by willingly submitting to his teaching. 
Now, he describes not only his yoke, but he describes himself. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I don't know about you, but when uh, I was going through school, especially through secondary school, um, before each term or certainly before each year, uh, we would also be interested to find out who was going to be teaching us maths or English or whatever else it was. And sometimes when you found out who the teacher was, you'd be saying, oh no, she is, she is really a control freak or she's really a disciplinarian or he is this or he is that. The character of the teacher is so important in the relationship between the teacher and student. And Jesus is saying, if you take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He is the great teacher. Uh, There's no other teacher like him. Because his character means that when you take his yoke upon you, you learn from him as one who is genuinely interested in your well-being. I'm not saying I'm not saying teachers in school weren't that, of course, uh, but they were mere human beings. They did their best. But the character of the teacher is so important to the pupil who's learning. And the more that character is an attractive character, a dedicated character, a character that you can see is lovingly committed to your teaching, to uh, uh, to teaching you the things that are in their remit to teach, the more uh, likely it is that you're going to learn. The only way you're not going to learn with that kind of teacher is just to willingly neglect being taught. And what Jesus is saying is that if you take my yoke upon you, learn of me, learn from me, because I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart. He is the most humble, the meekest, the most gentle, and therefore the most effective teacher that you could get. And it reminds us too, doesn't it, that our relationship, uh, our salvation rather, is a a matter of a relationship to a person, not just being in a school formally, not just being a disciple in the sense of being taught and nothing more than that, because ordinarily when you're taught in this life, whether it's university or school, whatever it is, you're taught by whoever it is that's teaching you, different types of teachers, and then you go home and that's it until the next time you're in class. But with Jesus, uh, it's always an ongoing relationship with himself. And that's what salvation is really about. Coming to know Jesus for yourself. Uh, Remember in John chapter 4, the people of uh, that town in Samaria uh, that the woman went to, and she told them about this person that she'd met at the well. Is not this the Christ? He told me all things that ever I did ever I did, come and see this man. So off they went, out they went to see him. They took her at her word, and they went out to listen to him. And then he stayed with them at their request for a further time. And then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of your word. It didn't mean that they weren't accepting her word anymore, but not primarily for your word, For we have heard him for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Christ. There's the key to the issue. They had heard about him from the woman, but now they had heard him for themselves. They had heard himself. He himself had spoken to them. He had taught them. That's what a disciple of Jesus is. That's what it is to follow Jesus. That's what daily life is like with Jesus. You want to hear his own voice. When you get up in the morning, before you go to bed at night and through the day, you want to take him to work with you so that you're actually listening to him. You'll read the Bible with a prayer that God will speak to you, that he will actually address you, that these words will come off the page and you will realize again that Jesus is speaking directly with you. And that's really such an an amazing privilege when we deserve the very opposite of all that. And here is Jesus Today he's saying, I am gentle and lowly in heart. But he also says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that seems a bit surprising, really, doesn't it? Because the teaching of Jesus, when you consider the whole of the teaching that Jesus gives us through the Scriptures, you might say, well, I don't see that as being easy or light. And what he means, of course, is 
comparing it with the yoke of the Pharisees, comparing it with legalism, comparing it with just a do-it-yourself salvation, this is not burdensome. Because for one thing, when you come to Jesus, uh, one of the first things you actually are aware of is a sense of relief, isn't it? A sense of relief. The burden has gone off your back. You're no longer left trying to do it yourself. And that relief is so important to you because you realize somebody else has taken over the control of your life. Somebody else has actually come and managed your life for you. And my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Well, this word uh, reminds us that uh, when we come to himself and when we come to take his yoke upon us, Compared to every other teaching, compared to every other relationship, uh, this one is comforting. This one is special. This one is unlike any other. You know, sometimes we hear uh, people saying that uh, they were converted to Christianity. And they'll say, when I was converted to Christianity. And of course, in many respects, um, these people are not saying they're not genuinely converted But it's not the best way of putting it, is it, when people say, when I was converted to Christianity, because we're not converted to a religion, even to Christianity. We're converted to Christ. We're converted to a person. We come to be joined to Him, not merely to His teaching, not merely to the Bible, not just to Christianity or to any creed. When I was converted to Christ, come to me, take my yoke upon you. And when you come to be yoked to himself and take the yoke of his teaching, that is the most special relationship that exists between a disciple and Jesus. And you will find rest for your souls. Come to me and I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your souls when you take my yoke upon you. That's a great relief, as I've said. And this rest, the word rest there really It includes also the idea of refreshment, of getting refreshment, uh, something that really refreshes you physically. Whatever it is, is something that you really value greatly when you need refreshment and you take something that refreshes you or some means or other by which you're refreshed. When you're tired, when when your head is hanging down, when you get refreshment, it's a very special experience. And Jesus is using this word rest in that sense as well. It includes the idea of refreshment because when you come to him and when you take his yoke upon you, what you're experiencing really is new life. New life. Your soul is refreshed. You come to be revived, vivified, quickened with new life. That doesn't mean Of course, as we're seeing in these studies, that the way is going to be very easy. He doesn't mean that at all when he's saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It doesn't at all suggest, as you very well know, that the problems in your life are going to disappear, that the things that will cause you pain will not exist anymore in your life. But he is saying this, I'm carrying the yoke with you. I'm beside you, I'm with you, I'm in you. You're special to me, he's saying. And so I will remember you when... You come into all of these experiences. It's not going to be without me. It's going to be by my grace and by my presence that you're going to go on living as my disciple. As uh, Horatius Bonner put it in another verse from that hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. Or in the words of Augustine, who in a prayer he said, words which are often quoted as he was addressing God, Thou hast made us for Thyself, and our soul can find no rest until we find our rest in thee. How is it with yourself? Are you at rest today? 
Are you at rest in Christ? Are you at rest with Christ? Or have you not yet come and taken his yoke upon you? Let's pray. Lord, our gracious God, forgive us for our reluctance, we pray. Our reluctance to accept your will, our reluctance to obey, our reluctance to come to you, our reluctance to leave confidence in ourselves or in others, uh, our reluctance also to take your yoke upon us. For it is not something that we do once in a while, O Lord. We are conscious that each day that passes is a day of opportunity for us, a day of responsibility to take your yoke upon us, to learn from you to be taught by you. O oh Lord, we pray that our hearts will increasingly be molded by you and shaped and conformed to your will and help us gladly to carry that yoke of your teaching and help us to rejoice in the fact of being yoked together with you. For we know that way that we are never going to be on our own again and that you will be with us even through life and death and into eternity. So receive us, we pray now, and continue with us throughout this day and be with us in the evening as we expect again to come to worship you. We ask it all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing psalm today is Psalm 119, 119 from the Sing Psalms version. And this is on page 165. We're singing verses 129 to 136. Your statutes, Lord, are wonderful. So I obey them from my heart. Your words as they unfold give light and truth to simple minds in part. Through to verse 136. Your statutes, Lord, are wonderful. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.